So please remember Steve and Sheila and Michael and all that's going on in their world. Uh, because I'm, I'm going to have kind of an extended time, Steve being gone this fall, uh, I'll be teaching Sunday school a lot. I was thinking, what can I do in this brief amount of time? And I realized it's been quite a long time since I've taught Leviticus in the church here. Can't teach the whole book. But one of my favorite parts of Leviticus is the first, first chapter. You get the five sacrifices. And there's such a beautiful picture of the cross of Calvary. And I, I thought, well, I'm going to do that for my own sake as well as for yours. And I, I think some of you were there for that series. Some that will be here will not. But I think it will be a blessing to you anyway uh, together. Very, very significant to me that the book of Exodus starts with God redeeming the people out of Egypt. Then he gives them the Ten Commandments, Law, Mount Sinai, and then the case law that, the, that, uh, that follows the giving of the Ten Commandments, which expands each of the commandments into different specifics. Right after the law is the building of the tabernacle. That's of huge significance. The law is to drive us to Christ. The tabernacle is all about Christ, who he is and what he's done. And it was in the tabernacle that God dwelt among his people. And it, the tabernacle was the place that people, the sinful people, met God through sacrifice. And then you get the book of Leviticus, which expands upon all that stuff. This is Christ in the Old Testament. And if we think that uh, the pro prophecies of the Old Testament are just Isaiah 53 or 22 or 16, or Psalm 22 and Psalm 16, and a few other passages, we are not understanding the Old Testament. Jesus said, Moses wrote of me. That's what he said. So Genesis is all about Jesus. Exodus is all about Jesus. Leviticus is all about Jesus. Numbers is all about Jesus. Deuteronomy is all about Jesus. Moses wrote of me. Now, that brings great clarity to folks who grasp that and see that. And it, it brings great judgment on those who refuse to see it. Because it's there. There's nothing subtle about it. If someone reads the Old Testament and meditates on the arguments of the books and goes through it, it is there. And uh, what's the old saying? Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once we see Christ in the Old Testament, as he taught in Leviticus, or in Luke 24, and God opened them scriptures in Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, all the things concerning himself, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It is there. And I know a veil is on people's hearts when they read the Old Testament in 2 Corinthians 3. That's true, but that the problem lies in the heart, not in the revelation. So God has been very clear as he could be in a very subtle way to give us a, a, a Bible that is so clear about what he's going to do over centuries that really just locks the door against legitimate unbelief. Some people think unbelief is a virtue. Some people think seeking is a virtue. I'll just be a seeker my whole life. I never settle down on anything. The Bible is written in such a way to close the door to unbelief and to open our understanding of life and God. Now, why should Christians be interested then in learning the book of Leviticus? Uh, this is above above average difficult book to study. It's difficult even to read. I remember as a young Christian trying to read Leviticus for the first time, and it was a real challenge. And I got CHM out and had got some help from him, but it still was a real challenge. And uh, young Christians especially uh, need 
the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first part of the Bible. <coughs> and But then think about how much work it is to really dive into it. 50 chapters of Genesis, 40 chapters in Exodus, uh, 36 chapters in Numbers, 34 chapters in Deuteronomy. Oh, I skipped Leviticus, 27 in Leviticus. Leviticus is the shortest of the five books of Moses. It's one of the most difficult. It's the briefest. It's the shortest book of the Pentateuch. Genesis is the longer, is the longest. <coughs> and uh, so, um, anyway, but Leviticus is the shortest. Now, why should we seek to saturate ourselves with this little book in the middle of the Pentateuch? It seems so foreign on the surface to our daily life. When was the last time you offered an animal sacrifice? When was the last time you officiated in a ceremonial way as a priest? The religious days, the holy days, the ritual cleansing laws, they're not Jews. We're not even under the law. We do not have a temple. We don't have a tabernacle. Uh, we don't offer animal sacrifices. And all that ritual cleansing is not part of what God wants of us. So Leviticus can feel like a, a Model T. And, you know, when we were, when we were in um, Greenfield Village, we actually drove, we got to ride in a Model T, and it was a lot of fun. I would love to have driven one of them things. We didn't have that option. But we did have an option of riding in one for, I think it was eight bucks a person. But I'd never ridden in one, so I wanted to. So we took a Model T ride around Greenfield Village. And I thought that was fun. But riding in a Model T seems like kind of an antiquated way of travel, right? I don't think I'd want to take one across the country. And so uh, it, it, it seems like a fun thing to know about, experience, but not something to get overoccupied with, Model T. Well, isn't Leviticus a little bit like that? It's a back there thing. It was something back there, and it's not something that has very much relevance to us other than a inter interesting uh, thing of history. Well, turn with me to Isaiah 8 before we get started in Leviticus. Turn with me to Isaiah 8. In verse 20, in Isaiah chapter 8, God says to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Now, the context is wizards and, and uh, all that kind of stuff, people claiming to have revelation, verse 19, then they shall say to you, seek unto those who are mediums and wizards that peep and mutter. Should not people seek their God? Should they seek on behalf of the living, the, to the dead? And if they speak to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Now, what does that mean? It means that further revelation needs to agree with previous revelation. It needs to be a connection. A legitimate connection. It can't just be something more, something else. It has to connect. I suppose it'd be like a train cars and a caboose or an engine. Further revelation needs to connect. It needs to be coupled to previous revelation. Because God is the same. He changes not. And there is a progression of truth, of revelation that God's giving us, but that progression should never be uncoupled to previous revelation. 
And so it's like, if you say, if you give instructions on something and you give somebody further instructions, your further instructions should agree with your previous instructions, right? Unless something has happened that you didn't foresee or didn't know about, but God foresees everything. And so there should be a continuity between what God says later than what he said at the beginning. And so that congruity and that continuity is very important. And it's a principle that future revelation must agree with previous revelation. Doesn't have to be the same. Doesn't have to be exactly the same, but it has to have some connection. Now, the Pentateuch is a foundation on which the rest of the Old Testament and the Bible is built. And that foundation uh, agrees with the superstructure, and the superstructure should agree with the foundation. And the Pentateuch itself, the first five books, provides and promises future revelation. This is very, very important. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19 speaks that there will be further revelation from God, that there will be prophets, that there will be a series of prophecies. Some will be false prophets and some will be true prophets. And then there'll be the ultimate prophet. Turn to Deuteronomy 18. Uh, Deuteronomy 18. Hold your place in Leviticus. It's quite important that the last book of the Pentateuch that Moses wrote, I believe he did write it, predicted other revelations from God other than the Pentateuch. So it wasn't like, all right, we got the foundation, we don't need anything else. This is all we have is the Torah, that's all we'll ever get. And that's not the position of the Torah itself. Deuteronomy 18, 15. But there is a warning that not only will there be true revelation, progressive revelation, there'll be false prophets who will pretend to be from God, as well as true prophets who will come from God. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord thy God will raise up to thee a prophet from among the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me. Moses said, like to me, unto him you will hearken. Now, that's obviously talking about Jesus Christ. We know that later. According to all that you desire of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord of God, neither let me see this great fire any more, and that I die not. And the Lord said to me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren. Like unto thee, he's going to be a like unto Moses person. He's going to have authority from God. He's going to have a message from God. And I'll put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Now, the New Testament is full of references to this. The New Testament applies this specifically to Jesus Christ, right? And it will come to pass that whoever will not hearken to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I'll require it. Now, verse 20, but the prophet who shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, who shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. You will say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? But a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that's the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously, you will not be afraid of him. So. Without getting into great detail in Deuteronomy, it, uh, Deuteron that chapter in Deuteronomy provides for future revelation. So the Sadducee position was wrong, right? They only believed in the first five books of the Bible. At least the Pharisees got that right. They didn't get everything right, but they knew there was more than the first five. The Sadducees only believed the Pentateuch. They wouldn't go farther than that. And so here uh, there is an idea that there's two ideas in Deuteronomy 18. 
One, God's uh, three ideas. God's going to speak in the future. It's not just going to be Deuteronomy. There'll be legitimate prophecy. And, uh, and but there will be legitimate prophecy and false prophecy. And you and you got to test it whether it comes to pass or not. What he says to so the future, the ability to tell the future is one of the signs of a true prophet versus a false prophet. And so it provides for a couple of other things. There'll be a series of prophecies, some false and some true. The need to be tested, and then there'll be the ultimate prophet, like unto Moses, who is the Messiah. Everybody follow me with that? This is a very clear thing. Moses is the beginning, not the end, and the ultimate. His revelation is foundational and prophetic. There's more to come. And Jesus said that in Luke 24, and Jesus said that in John 5, 45, 46, that God was going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses. Now, therefore, if Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses, we believe he is, then every the previous revelation that came before him should talk about him. Is everybody with me? Not just in this prophecy. He is the subject. The written words about the living word. In Genesis, we should see Jesus. In Exodus, we should see Jesus. In Numbers, we should see Jesus. In Deuteronomy, we should Jesus. We should see Jesus. And in Leviticus that we're looking at, we should see Jesus. I was a, a summer assistant pastor of Dover Bible Church, and we built a brand new building, set 300 people, and filled it. Uh, but uh, one of the guys that was in the church that time was in a Bible class of mine. He was a, he was a bricklayer and uh, wonderful wonderful individual, wonderful wife. And uh, I, I remember when his, I, I wasn't there, but he told me when his wife was dying, he said to him, I'm putting my hand in Jesus's hand right now. That was her last words. It was amazing. He really did see Jesus at the end. I'm not saying everybody will, but apparently she may have. But I, I know it, it, it's... Um, it was, it's interesting that uh, our workman, that was his name, made a sign for the church, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, it was right there. And we feed on Christ, because he is, he is our spiritual food. He's the bread that came down on heaven. If we feed on him and he's everywhere, the Bible is like a pasture of revelation for us to graze in. And in Chillicothe Bible Church, which I've preached in that pulpit many times, uh, there is another verse quoted, Sir, we would see Jesus. It's on a plaque right, where the, right here where every speaker could see it. You couldn't preach in that church without seeing it. And they had a great big spotlight that came down like this. And it was like, can't miss that. You've got this is what this church wants. We would see Jesus. So let's think about this and let's think through this a little bit. Um, specifically, the death of the Messiah which is crucial for all further revelation, must be embedded in the Pentateuch. It's connected to the foundation. Uh, it's like upright pieces of rebar. <laughs> the, 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 the building is connected. And that's Genesis 3.15, Genesis 22, the sacrifice of Isaac, the Joseph story. Uh, the different uh, three patriarchal sons, all kinds of stuff is going on there. Judah offering himself up for Benjamin, the whole Joseph story. And <coughs> why do I need Genesis if I've got the four Gospels? People say you can chuck the Old Testament. You don't need it. <coughs> Well, it's true. In the Gospels, we've got beautiful 
uh, verbal photographs of Jesus. But there's something interesting about photographs versus paintings. And I'm not an artist, although my kids are very artistic and so is my wife. But sometimes a painting can show more than a photograph. Because the artist's eye is involved. And that's a, a, a awesome thing. A, a paintings can express better with an artist's eye and an artist's hand and an artist's heart better than a photograph. Now, sometimes phot photographs are better than paintings. I know that. Sometimes paintings are better than photographs. Sometimes actors in a movie can ex express visually and verbally the inner conflicts that they're supposed to express. Sometimes they're overexpressive, and most people are not that. But most people are not that flamboyant or transparent. A good actor will express with his face despair or fear or anger or whatever. They visually express inner. They're able to visually express inner feelings. And now, why is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers so important then? There's an artistic thing going on here, poetically. There's an artistic thing going on here in the typology. There's an artistic thing going on here in the sacrifice. There's an artistic thing going on in the temple, tabernacle, all these types. In Exodus, you have Moses to deliver. You have the Passover lamb. You got the tabernacle where God dwells with his people. And there's just no way. When I look at Exodus, and I was talking to Troy about Exodus. I mean, the first part of the for Sunday school, the first part of Exodus is law. You get, get them out of Egypt and then the law to the people who are redeemed. But the second part of Exodus is the tabernacle. It just dwells on God dwelling on his with his people on the basis of animal sacrifice and all the priest and all the moving of the blood and all of that stuff. Now, let's come back to the Pentateuch and the significance of Leviticus. I've taught chiasm here, and I know, I know it can be overdone, and some people always see in chiasm everywhere, but in chiasm, the central truth is in the middle. right? And uh, you, everything moves towards the middle in a chiastic structure. The main truth, the main point, is in the center of the poem, or not on the not in the beginning or the end, but the center. And many prophecies are chiastic. chiastic. There's a lot of interesting stuff here. But if you believe that the death of Messiah is important, if we believe that the official business of the Messiah was not just to come and be with his people, but to die for his people, for the sins of his people, and all you got is Isaiah 53 and 22, Psalm 22 and Deuteronomy 9 and stuff like that, well, I'm glad you got that, but I, I, I want to say there's a lot more. There are these scattered prophecies. There is a chain of promises and prophecies, Genesis 3.15 and Numbers 21. But guess what? What is the center of the first five books of the Bible? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Center is Leviticus. You've got two books before it, two books after. So it's the center. It's the center of that initial revelation from God through Moses. And at the center of the initial revelation of God, the nation's sins are paid for by sacrificial death of a substitute slain by God's ordained priest. God ordains in Leviticus a way of dealing with sins of his people. Now, that's interesting. And let me ask you this, and I'm going to ask you another question. Could you begin to even, could you begin to understand the book of Hebrews if you didn't have Leviticus? 
Could you begin to write Hebrews if you didn't have Leviticus? <laughs> you couldn't even write it, let alone understand it. It's the book of Leviticus that paves the way for understanding the book of Hebrews, which is one of my favorite books in the Bible. The law, shadow of what? Good things. Possible that those sacrifices are offered day by day, take away sins. You know, it's it's a shadow. It it's a preview. It's a there's a there's a work that's going on there. So a knowledge of Leviticus, at least some knowledge of Leviticus, not necessarily encyclopedic knowledge of Leviticus, but some knowledge of Leviticus and the Levitical background and the animal sacrifice system and the priest and the altar and the blood is necessary as a foil to the work of Christ. The contrast is the perpetual work of the Aaronic priesthood and the animal sacrifice with the finished work of the Melchizedekian priest and Jesus Christ. You can never, you can't even, you can't even talk about the finished work the way you should without the Levitical priesthood and the continual sacrifice and the perpetual priesthood. You see how this fits together? It's like God, it's like God's the ultimate tutor. Teaching you addition and subtraction, and now you got multiplication and division. And now, now you're ready for theological algebra when you get to the New Testament, and you can put in the oh, okay, now I can do this. Alan Ross has got a wonderful uh, commentary on the Book of Leviticus, and he said Leviticus was and is one of the most important books of the Old Testament. It not only presents the entire religious system of ancient Israel, but it also lays the theological foundation for the New Testament teaching about the atoning work of Jesus Christ. R.K. Harrison was a very famous uh, Old Testament scholar in, back in, I was in seminary, he was still living, and he said in the, of the book of Leviticus, in this book is to be found the basis of Christian faith and doctrine. So that's interesting. In this book is to be found the basis of Christian faith and doctrine. So you've had this experience and I've had this experience. We show somebody Psalm 22, show somebody... Uh, Psalm 16, we show somebody Isaiah 53 and they blow it off. Uh, you, you can make prophecy mean anything. They say stuff. And the Jews say it's about them. G you Christians say it's about Jesus and, uh, and you know, all that stuff. Well, all the, the prophecies are not the only thing. The prophecies are just part of the Pentateuch. Not the whole thing. There are prophecies in the Pentateuch. There are promises in the Pentateuch. But there's also typology in the Pentateuch. And the book of Leviticus is right at this. And so it's not like the Jews killed Jesus and we want him to be the Messiah. So now we got to make up something. We've got to make the bait. The Christians had to make up uh, a, a reason for his death and make up a reason for uh, his being killed because they wanted to hang on to that idea he was the Messiah. And so they made up the resurrection, they made up the death, and all is it kind of like, okay, well, this will be plan B. No, that's not the way the Old Testament is structured. Jesus is our is our Isaac. He is on the altar. He is the, the, the son that's loved by the Father. He is the son that's sacrificed. And he is all those pictures. But he's not also not just the center of pictures in Genesis and Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. He's the very heart of God dwelling with his people. When we were in Israel, I, I had confirmed to me the picture that I got through my study in the Bible. The uh, temple that Solomon built later was rebuilt was right beside the palace of the king. The king. 
It's actually connected. Well, you got the in Jerusalem, you got the palace of the Davidic kings and the temple side by side and connected. Temples where sacrifices are made, palace is where the king lives. The temple is where God lives in the Holy of Holies and manifests his presence. What is that whole thing saying? It is a pictorial prophecy at the very heart of everything in the Old Testament that the Messiah is going to be a Davidic descendant and an incarnate God who's going to sacrifice himself for his people it is a preview and therefore a confirmation that the Christians get it right and nobody else. So very fascinating. It's curious to me that the book of Leviticus, this is a very curious fact. They memorize it. Can you imagine trying to memorize the book of Leviticus? It was actually the best known, it was one of the best known books in the Old Testament to the Jews. I mean, they knew the facts, but they missed the point. <laughs> but they, they, they really got into this because they knew this is how our sins are dealt with. It, it was one of the best known books of the Old Testament among the Jews. But what it tells us is Jesus' death was not a martyrdom of someone who thought he was the Messiah and was properly executed by the Jews for claiming it. Jesus' death was a sacrifice of the God-man. And it's in Leviticus we get the vocabulary and the terminology and the theological M images and ideas to properly interpret the death of the Messiah. You've got to have, you've got to have some of this in your background be able to even know what his death for our sins is all about. And you see the animals dying for people's sins and the blood being applied, and all that suffer and the animal suffers for the offer of the animal. Well, then you have a vocabulary, then you have a, a, a way of thinking, then you have a way of communicating. Uh, the greater truth. So the previous truth. This is how we all learn, right? We have to know some things to learn other things. We can't just jump into uh, the deep, the harder stuff. We have to know certain things to learn other things, and that takes work, whatever it is. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, it says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Underline this part, who his own self or our sins in his own body on the tree that we should be dead to sins and should live to righteousness by whose stripes you're healed. You see, that verse is kind of important, isn't it? But imagining, try to understanding what Peter is saying if there was no Old Testament, no sacrificial system, no offerings of priests, of animals, and everything else. And so, kind of important. In 2 Peter 1.20 says, Knowing this, that no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation or prophecy came not at any time but the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. There was a superintending of the writing of the book. And this modern idea that faith is a leap in the dark and that you, you, faith is believing with no evidence, that is a false definition of faith. Modern Modern popular neo atheists have a they, they they create this false definition of faith it, that faith is believing in it uh, without evidence and sometimes in spite of the evidence. That's not a biblical definition of faith. It, it proves their total total ignorance of the Bible. 
They don't even grasp what's going on here. They don't have a clue. <coughs> and uh, Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, without spot, that's a Leviticus term, it, to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, a means of death for the redemption of transgressions were in the First Testament, they were called, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So his blood went backwards and forwards, didn't it? It covered the people who were under the sacrificial system as well as comes forward to us. Now I got a little more, and we're almost, we're almost ready to close this morning. This is kind of an introduction to this study. But I want you to think about this one. And I got this from somebody who got this from somebody else. <laughs> and W. Shia has proposed that the overall structure of Leviticus is a huge chiasm or introversion in chapter 1 to 25. Don't expect you to follow this completely. I just want you to get this. The chapter 16 at this point. followed by concluding chapter. Now, if that man is right, the center of Leviticus is chapter 16. What is the chapter? What is in chapter 16? Anybody know? The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, that we're, going, that we're dealing with the Jewish calendar right now. I forget where we are in that. We're not quite there, the Day of Atonement. They celebrate every year. But in the Old Testament, they celebrated it with what? Two goats. One goat died, and one goat was led into the wilderness. So one goat died for the sins of the nation. The other goat uh, was led away and bore the sins away. That's a day of atonement. Now, that's a fascinating thing. And you have these five sacrifices in the beginning of the book of Leviticus that we're going to study. They were kind of like the routine dealing with sin. But once a year, every year, they had a Yom Kippur. They had a Day of Atonement where the sins of the whole nation were taken away by the sacrificial system. And the priest had to be cleansed first before he offered the sacrifice. The priest had to be ritually sinless, I'm not saying personally sinless, but he had to offer a sacrifice for himself, and then he offered the sacrifice for the nation. So it pictured a priest who was pure, paying for the sins of the nation, pictured by two goats, one who died and one who carried the sin away. That's the center, which means it's the main point. So it's not like we Christians are reading back into the Old Testament something that's not really as important in the Old Testament, and we're making it more than it is. A sacrifice dying for sins and paying for sins and carrying the sins away is the center. Just like Isaiah 53 is the center of chapters 40 to 66, 26 chapters. If you add 13, which is half of 26, you get Isaiah 53, 40. So that chapter is the center of the comfort section. It's about the death and resurrection of the servant of the Lord. So how many ways does God have to show us this is the program? That's the point. And I love this. I love this kind of stuff. It's subtle, but it's also clear. Uh, did you know the book of Leviticus is referred to multiple times in the New Testament? And there's different calculations to that, but there's constant references to the book of Leviticus. It was the first book Jewish children could memorize. 
that memorize. And it's the last book Christian read. I remember as a young Christian, I, I started working through Leviticus and I thought, oh, I'm going to skip this. It's just too tough. It's just too tough. And I went on to something I could sink my teeth in. But it was the first book they read, the last book the church reads, and yet there was a veil on their heart when they read it. So they got, we need a sacrifice for sin. But they were fine with the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament priesthood and never saw the Messiah needed sacrifice. He couldn't get that. I read about years ago about a, a fellow who was starting a church in Michigan. This is an interesting story. He was starting a church from scratch, and that's pretty hard. And I've, been, I've done that. I know what that's like. He was starting a church from nothing. And, uh, you know, if you're starting a church from nothing, you're wanting to get contacts, you're wanting to get new people in. And not only you're wanting to get them in, you want to keep them. You know what that man did? He said, I want to know if God's going to start this church or, or me. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to, my first book study is going to be the book of Leviticus on Sunday morning. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's interesting, isn't it? And so may God help us uh, as we study this and just be thrilled by it and have the maturity to see, yeah, there's a lot in there. There's a lot in Leviticus 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6. I don't get a lot of this just over my head. And I'm getting something, and I'm getting, I'm getting part of it, and what I do get is really good stuff. It's really good stuff. Alan Ross wrote, for the Christian, the theology of the Old Testament passage or book is incomplete without the New Testament correlation. And the New Testament draws heavily on Leviticus. Many parts of the gospel simply assume the reader has a knowledge of Leviticus. Passages that mention purification after childbirth, washing after the healing of the leper, journeys to the feast in Jerusalem, separation from Gentiles and eating, all show how completely Leviticus was ingrained in the thinking of the people. But beyond that, the interpretation of the person and works of Jesus the Messiah in the books like Romans and Hebrews and Petrine, Peter, Petrine epistles, shows that the foundation of the gospel is here in the book of Leviticus. Are you starting to get excited about Leviticus a little bit? You're starting to realize this is kind of important. I need to go home and read Leviticus. Uh, and when I do, I'm not going to understand 80% of it, but I'm going to get something and I'll maybe read it the second time, the third time, and I'll get a little more. So may God help us as we seek to do that. Um, one writer I was reading quotes a man by the name of Mays, M-A-Y-S. He writes on Leviticus, and he's not conservative by any length. He's just a scholar. He's just a scholar, Hebrew scholar but a high-powered high Hebrew scholar. And he surveys the book of Leviticus with a series of questions. Number one, how do sinful and defiled people maintain fellowship with their covenant God? He's surveying the book with that question. Number two, uh, the ritual sacrifices of Leviticus 10 to 7 how shall their sacrifices reach the holy God in worship and God reach them? The answer, the consecrated mediatorial priesthood, Leviticus 8 to 10. So the first chapters of Leviticus are the sacrifices, and then you go to the priests. So you not just need a sacrifice, you need a priest. You don't just need an animal sacrifice, you need a human priest. You need something more than an animal sacrifice. You've got to have a priest to offer that perfect sacrifice. Question, how shall the holiness of God dominate, sanctify, profane life? Answer, Emmanuel purification, Leviticus 11 to 16. Question, how shall the people obey God so holiness becomes a way of life? Answer, the exhortations to holiness in chapter 17 to 26. 
that's all interesting, isn't it? Here's a guy that gets some of the structure. So yeah, this is some of what's going on. Now in the New Testament, God says, Behold, be ye holy. Does God say that in the New Testament? Yeah. And uh, when you turn to the book of Leviticus, you find out that's a motto of the book. Turn with me to Leviticus 11, 44. Leviticus 11, 44. I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That's Old Testament law, but what did God say? I'm holy, so you got to be holy. Uh, Leviticus 19, 2. Leviticus 19, 2. Speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, say to them, You be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 19 2, 20 26. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from other people. You should be. So God says, I'm holy, so you got to be holy. I am not going to come down to your level to live with you. You got to come up to my level. And it might just be ritually by offering sacrifices and recognizing your sin, but you have to come up to my level. That's the way most wives are when you marry husbands. When you marry husbands or at least try to be. <laughs> we husbands were pretty messy around the house. We, 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 we're we okay if the dishes pile up. Women can't live that. Then it just piles up and we'll do them at the end of the week. Women got to do it after every meal. So it's just they have a different they have a different thing. And that's good for us. It's bad that we aren't better. I'm talking about myself now. But it's bad we, we should their standard is good. But they demand. <laughs> and sometimes they're gracious and uh, they 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 put up with stuff, but they really want us to come up to a better level, and that's good for every man. And if you don't know the difference, look at a man who lives with a with a he's married and a guy that lives on himself on his own, <laughs> and the level of housekeeping that uh, is going on. And some of us were single for a long time, haven't got completely out of that singleness, but our wives are gracious that they keep. God says, "I'm holy, and you're going to be holy. It's not going to be I'm going to come down to your level. You got to come up to what." That's what the cross is all about. That's what Leviticus is all about. And that's this, this is just part of the beautiful story that God has taken to write all these books of the Bible that we should get it. May God help us to get it. God help us to uh, learn we have to be holy. God, God demands it. Our, our sin is not something to be taken lightly. Our sin is to be dealt with daily to confess our sins. and. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We should not take loose living, loose um, uh, ways of life easily. May God help us. Father, we thank you for what we've looked at in the book of Leviticus and uh, who can dwell with everlasting burnings, who can dwell with a holy God, only a blood-bought people, saved through the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for what we looked at again and what a confirmation that this this center of the early books of the Bible are all about our Lord and his sacrifice. Not something that's read back into them, it's something that's there to show us that it was your plan all along. 